But I discovered that preaching at 8.30 and then turn around and coming back at 10.30, this is kind of interesting to me. I've never done it before. Uh, I shouldn't say I've never done it. I've, the last time I did that, I was preaching at a um, Southern Baptist church and an Assemblies of God church, which was, people said, that, well, isn't that a kind of a conflict? I said, no, we're all pretty much using the same buck. You know, our, I'm, but uh, we would run up to one church, I would preach there, and then we would hightail it back to the other church and preach there, and then on Sunday nights we reverse the process. But uh, I never preached the same message, so this is going to be interesting to me. I would like to share with you for a while this morning, um, I told them this morning that I would try to make sure it didn't take longer than three hours, but Wendy let me know that on this service we don't have the time span, so we can go four. So, amen? Everybody ready for that? Did you ever wonder? <laughs> did you ever wonder about? There's that passage in the Bible that I've loved, where the the apostles and the, uh, in the upper, one of the upper rooms and he's teaching, and it says because he went long, and it got warm that there was this poor young guy sitting in a window, fell asleep, fell out, hit the ground and died. You would have thought that would have been the end of service right there, but no, they go out. And he prays for him, the guy comes back to life, and they go up and they continue on with church. Aren't you glad we don't have services that long? But uh, I would love to see that happen one of these days. Uh, I want to share with you for a while, though, on the Job experience. Now, if you've, I don't know how many of you have ever sat down and just read through the whole book of Job. It, um, some people think it's depressing. I think it's exciting. Because it really shows the human um, emotion that we all go through during different aspects of our life, typically through devastation in our life. And that's what I want to look at a little bit this morning. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and we stop there. You have to have the second part if you're going to truly have faith. And it says this, And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently Seek Him, good times and in bad. We must believe that He is still a rewarder. And that's hard to do. When everything goes bad in your life, you more than typically we feel like God's out to get us. We don't feel like He's rewarding us. But the Job experience begins to recognize some aspects of this. Every Christian at some point or another is going to go through a low point in their life. We're going to face challenges, disappointments, even failures. But there's questions that come up, and I've got three of them that I'd like to present with you this morning. Um, where's Manny at? Oh, there you are. I saw you back there earlier. Since Pastor's not here, I'm not going to pick on you. <laughs> but I just wanted to see you sweat for a minute, so... <laughs> So if I had somebody come up here, you guys ever seen that trust test where you stand there and you fall backwards? Yep. So if I had somebody come up here and I told you and we got you ready and I told you to go ahead and fall backwards, would you guys trust me to catch you? Yes. Some of you are like, no. Some are like, yes. Those of you that said yes, why would you trust me? Not one time did I say I would catch you. <laughs> but it's human nature that it's easier for us to trust somebody that's with us than it is sometimes to trust an almighty God. And yet the Bible is full of promises after promises after promises to provide for us in every aspect of our life. So there's a human nature sometimes, though, that we try to take control of the situation. So the first question I have to you is during the hard times in your life, during times of despair and all this stuff that goes on, how will you respond? And the easy answer is, oh, I'll always be godly. This is where Job comes in. In the story of Job, we find six individuals that display human emotions during great catastrophes or great struggles in our life. Now, what's interesting to me is great struggles can be a variety of things. I, was, uh, I have friends in various countries, and um, some of us were sitting in a situation where we're going, oh, it can't get any worse, and then I, I'm on Facebook with these guys, and I'm looking at their situation, I'm like... Oh, you guys have no idea. I think I shared with you that there was one of the families that I've gotten to know over there that um, one of the, you know, they get rainy season, so water goes everywhere. And one of the creeks had diverted and literally flowed through their house. 
And um, he woke up, the beds were soaked, so they strung up hammocks for his six kids. And um, they picked up all of his stuff. And, and now most of us have been really freaking out. They were praising God. You know why? Because fish were in their house. And so they were going around with a laundry basket, gathering up the fish, talking about what a blessing it was from God. You guys would do the same thing, right? So in Job, what happens is, we know the story of Job. We know that he went through the loss of his children, the loss of his property and cattle and all this stuff. If you can kind of put yourself in his shoes this morning, it's like getting a phone call while you're just, everything's going well, and you get a phone call that literally says, hey, I hate to tell you this, but your kids had all gotten together for a party and the house burned down on them. You've lost all of them. How would you process that? And about that time, you get a call from the bank, hey, there was identity theft, you've lost all your money, you have no money. And I mean, this would go on. How would you process that? And it's hard to think about that, but some of us have faced those kind of challenges. It could have been the loss of a loved one, or, or somebody's lied about you and totally ruined your reputation, and you've done nothing wrong. It could be loss of money, whatever it is, but each of us at some point have faced challenges that have tr really caused us to question some things about our Christianity and our faith. And this is where Job was at. Now, the six people that we read there, every one of them knew God. It's important to understand this. Every one of the six people in the book of Job knew God, but they all responded differently. The wife we like to criticize her, but you got to stop and think, how would you respond if you had that phone call? She couldn't handle it. She couldn't deal with it. The pressure was overwhelming. And if you really put yourself in her shoes, you kind of understand some of that. Amen? And she's like, I, I can't. Curse God and die. I can't deal with this. And there's points in our life where if we're not careful, if our faith is not as strong as it should be, that's the point that we hit. And then you've got the three friends. And I have a, a redneck tongue, so trying to pronounce all these Hebrew names don't always work really well with me. I used to jokingly call these guys Mo, Larry, and Curly because they were three friends that just hung out with him. Now, the respect that I have for them is that they sat with him for seven days and never said a word. And that was good. The problem came in is that because of the devastation that they saw going on, instead of comforting him, they begin to challenge him. Folks, here in the body of Christ, when somebody's going through a bad time, don't tell them how bad they are. You guys know what I'm saying? Here's what they did. This is the three friends. It must be because Job sinned. Job is being chastened by God. He's got a life of folly. Job should repent. The wicked are always punished. Therefore, Job must be wicked. Um, they urge Job to repent time and time again. Then they even give him a sermon on what the wicked man is and why he's so wicked. How many people know that Job just received such comfort from these words? But you know what? If we're not careful, have you ever noticed that there's people that are going through bad times in their life and we say, oh, this must be what's going on. I've even heard people that are struggling with cancer. I've had people go to them and say, well, you know, if you'd repent of your sin, God could heal you. Folks, be real careful what you say. Because if you're not, these things can do great damage. Then we see Job, and Job is the main character here. And Job goes through a, a progression of struggles that he dealt with. He dealt with depression. And then he had to feel like he had to defend himself and he becomes staunch in his righteousness to the point that he actually felt more righteous than God because God started, God was just bad to him. God was picking on him. You guys ever feel that way? Amen? And the reason it's important to understand these things and these emotions is because if we don't understand that we can go there, we don't prepare ourselves for it. Now, we've been talking in Bible studies a lot about the moving of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking in the church about worship and drawing close to God. Let me tell you something. Devastation, if you're not careful, can push you away rather than drawing you close. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to move in your life, you begin to worship God in the hardest times of your life, you will discover that God is still there. Here's what I've discovered in my life. God is God is God is God, both in the good times and in the bad times. Amen? 
And the promises of God dealing with my life and blessing my life and taking care of me and healing and all these things, it never went away. No matter how bad it got, God was still God and the promises are still true. Amen? Amen. Now here's what's really interesting to me. Job did not have a mediator. He actually talks about needing a mediator. Folks, we have a mediator. We are the most blessed people and don't recognize it. We get to the sixth person, young man, who has sat back and he's been quiet this whole time. But now he steps up in Job chapter 32, verses 1 through 9, and he says this. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Do you know what the Bible tells you about that? It says the ways of a man are he's righteous in his own eyes. We have to be careful of that. It says in the wrath of Elihu, and I'm going to go through all that. You guys can read all those people was aroused against Job. Now, he wasn't mad at Job. He was mad at the sin that Job was doing. He says his wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Have you ever found yourself there? I shared earlier that one of the things I found funny, when my wife's a baseball fan. I'm a baseball widow because I'm not a baseball person. I believe in real sports. If you can't get hurt, seriously maimed for life or killed, it's not a real sport. So I like football, hockey, and, and rodeos. Those are real sports. Praise the Lord. Anyway, we were watching one of the World Series, and my wife's a big Giants fan. Some of you may be praying for her at this moment. I don't know. But uh, she's a big Giants fan. Anyway, we were watching one of the World Series, and one of the things that I found really funny was as the camera was panning around the crowd, it was during a time when there was a tie. And so now we're into overtime. And they showed the opposing team, and they're all over there. And then they showed the Giants team, and they're all. How many people know that somebody did not get their, answers prayer, their prayers answered? So therefore, God must have forsaken them, because if God had really moved for them, they wouldn't have lost. Do you think there was probably some people that felt that way? And this is what Elihu was talking about. Because Job had decided that God was picking on him and God should have answered him. And so he became challenged with this. And verse 4 says, Now because they were years older than he, he had waited to speak to Job. And when he saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was aroused. And so he answered him and said this, I am young in years and you are very old. Therefore I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. I said, Age should speak. Notice the words should as he talks here. Age should speak and a multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Great men are not always wise, nor do age always understand justice. The reason I have him, the reason I wanted you to understand that is just because the, the Bible says those who think that they're steadfast, be cautious because you will be knocked down. And I'm paraphrasing. But you have to be careful that you think that you're just stable. Nothing in your life can sway you. It's God and me and we're good to go. And then something bad happens in your life and you realize that the relationship was not where it should have been. And this is what he's talking about. Understand that God sometimes allows challenges in your life so that you will have understanding. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 19, it says this, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Has anybody read in the Bible that said that you would go through suffering? Has anybody read in the Bible that said that you would be challenged? Has anybody read in the Bible where it says you would have to die out to self? That you would have to pick up his cross? Then why is it when those things happen, we go, Oh God, what are you, why are you doing this to me? Why am I so challenged, God? Why? And you, don't we do that? I had a young man in one of my youth groups years ago that prayed and prayed and prayed. He needed a red sports car. Oh, if God loved him, God would give him a red sports car. He ended up, and I kept telling him, I said, you know, you need to pray, God, give me the right car. Well, he ended up with a red sports car. After three speeding tickets, he was like, oh, God, please deliver me from the red sports car. Sometimes God's greatest thing is not answering your prayers. 
But we feel like somehow we're being robbed when he doesn't. And this is what Peter's talking about here. You guys realize you're going to go through challenges. The Bible tells us that we will be like gold refined in the, fire's fire, the refiner's fire. How many people know that that's not a comfortable process? And yet this is what he's telling us in verse 13. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of the glory of, in, of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Let none of you suffer as murderers, thieves, or evildoers, or, I love this line, or as busy, busybodies in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory in God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin where? At the house of God. It's talking about this one here. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in good, doing good as unto a faithful Creator. How many people love that last line? I don't know of anybody in their right mind that loves that last line. And the reason I say that is because what that's literally saying is so God's going to look in your life and say, you know what, I need to change this in them to draw them closer. So I'm going to allow these things to happen to draw them to the place where they will turn their life over to me. Now, I don't know about you guys, I hate that process with a passion. I jokingly say that I'm a two-by-four Christian because I'm a little stubborn. I know it's hard to believe the Scotchman could be stubborn, but sometimes I am. And so I say that I'm a two-by-four Christian because sometimes it takes a two-by-four, spiritually speaking, to get my attention. We're a little hard-headed. I jokingly tell my wife, she, she makes the comment, she said, why is it the things I know from Scotland are stubborn and opinionated? And I told her, I said, it's not true. We're right. <laughs> Anybody else have those kind of opinions? Amen? But I tell you what, that does not work well with God. And so there are things that happen in my life. There was a time that God was trying to get me to move from one area to another, and I fought him tooth and nail. I ended up in a head-on collision. Did God make me go through a head-on collision? No. My own stubbornness and pride brought me to the point that that was the only way that God could get my attention. So he allowed and this is what he's talking about. So I don't chastise God over that. I realize my faults in this, that God had to move that direction and allow things to draw me to the place that he wanted me to be. Now, in the end, there was great blessing. But I did not enjoy the process. How about you? So when these things begin to happen in your life, when there's loss and there's devastation in these things, how will you respond to those things? Are you going to be Job's wife and immediately brush the whole thing out, walk out the church of, of God here and say, you know what, if that's God, I want nothing to do with him. I mean, look what God did to me. God punished me. God did this. God did that. You know how many people I know that have done that with God? They've lost a loved one. That was God's fault. God should have healed them. I had, I had a lady and I had to work with this family. She was so upset with God because God caused her mother to die. I said, how old was your mother? 96. <laughs> but if God had moved, she would have been what, 97? Her mother was a very godly woman. But if we're not careful sometimes, we become so critical and so upset with God. And I, you guys know when I, when I speak, I'm very open with you. you know, I tell people this, and it's hard to believe sometimes, but you know what, what's weird for me is a day I don't hurt. Now, I don't blame God for that. I blame cliff climbing, riding Bronx, riding motorcycles, working in high-rise construction, head-on collisions. So should I be upset with God if I hurt? You guys know where I'm going with this. How do you respond in these areas of your life? That's a big question that we need to look at. Life is full of prisons. What we need to find is not how to avoid them, but rather how to 
how to have victory in spite of them. Because that's the reality. So the second question is this. Where will it take you? Some people it takes them right out of the house of God. Some people, they separate themselves from the body of Christ. That has never been what God has intended. Everything that God does, everything that God allows, is to draw you closer to Him. That's one of the reasons we've been teaching on the Holy Spirit. is because you need to hear from God in the worst times as well as in the best times. In Job chapter 33, verse 8 through 18, we, we go back to this young man. He says this, Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words, saying, I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there's no iniquity in me. How many people know that when you pray that, you're probably not right? Amen? He says in verse 10, Yet he finds occasion against me. He counts me as an enemy. He put my feet in stocks and watches all my paths. You ever find out how many times you've blamed God? I've watched people over the years, in many years of ministry now, blame God for flat tires, broken cars. I had one guy that was so upset with God because God allowed his tires to go flat. I said, how many miles you got on those? Because I looked at the tires, and they're bald, and there's treads sticking out. Well, I've done at least 80,000, but God could have got me further. How many people know God is not responsible for... Please excuse this if it offends you, but God is not responsible for stupidity. And sometimes, to be honest with you, we do some dumb things. Probably cliff climbing was not one of my smarter ventures. Amen? And so we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to be upset with God. But he goes on down and he says this, Look, in this you are not righteous, and I will answer you, for God is what? Greater than man. Amen? So why do we keep listening to man rather than God? He goes on down. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give an accounting of any of his words. For God may say in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream and a vision of night, when man's uh, sleep falls upon him while slumbering on their beds, when he opens their ears of men and seals their instructions, in order to turn man from his deeds to conceal pride from man, he keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by a sword. How many people know that God is constantly speaking to you? We just ignore him. Amen? And then what's funny is when we ignore him and bad things happen, we get upset. I shared this morning that there was a young man that God had told me to speak into his life. There was a situation that he was getting involved in. And I I went to him and I said, listen, God wants me to tell you something. There's this young woman you need to avoid. You need to stay away from her. Otherwise, God says, boom, 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 will happen. And he said, thank you, pastor. How many people know what he did? And when he came out of prison two years later, he said, I've learned I need to listen. Now, the good thing about that was he didn't blame God for that. And this is the response that we're supposed to have as God is speaking into our life. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says this, And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, Those who are called according to his purpose. We are called according to a purpose, but we need to understand that nothing but nothing but nothing is done against us. It's God moving for us. And that's what Job was struggling with because Job was at that point of great despair. And sometimes you get in a hole so far down, it's hard to see how to get up. And Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4 says this, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things of this earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We used to go backpacking with the kids, and I don't know how many times we would say, Oh, did you guys see that beautiful scene? What are you talking about? And then you get to watching them walk. And you guys all know how... A lot of teenagers walk, and I'm not criticizing you guys, but this is what you do. And I'm like, there's all this beautiful scenery. Yeah, I see it. (laughs) Did you see the eagle? No. You know, I just, and if we're not careful as Christians, that's what we're doing. Yes, I'm so glorified. God loves me so much. Yeah. 
why isn't this carpet better? This is not my favorite color. Obviously, you guys know my favorite color. Yellow. No. <laughs> but you know what? You guys know what I'm saying. You live in a house, and instead of saying, God, thank you for the house, we're like, oh, man, I really hate the color of this wall. We need to redo this. And then we start doing stuff in the house, and then we're like, God, you know what? Why does the house need so much maintenance? God, if you really love me, the house would stay up better. God, why did the roof, after 50 years, why did the roof finally go out? Couldn't you make it last longer? You, you guys know what I'm saying. We get so busy focused on all the stuff around us, but he says, look up. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but eventually you won't be here anymore. So why put so much into here when God wants us there? Amen? But if I'm not careful, I'm so devastated by what's bad here. My kids were teasing me the other day. Dad, you need a new truck. I said, why? Well, because this one, you know, the seat's not that great, and you, and you got this many miles on it. And I'm like, I like my truck. And they're like, but why? I said, because God gave me the truck. Amen. And when the truck finally dies, God will provide something else. I'm not going to sit there and look at all the scratches or all that stuff. It runs. Thank God. Amen. It's got four tires and still moving. And that's the way that we need to respond to these things. He goes here and he says this in Colossians um, chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. It says, And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So here's what I'm getting at when we talk about rising up here, or when we're talking about where we're going to respond. The words that come from your mouth, are they glorifying God? Or are you enforcing the fact that you feel downtrodden? You see, that was the problem. Instead of Job, when he first started, he glorified God. But eventually he allowed it to wear him down to where he began to justify everything in his life. And then he forgot where God was. But I got to tell you, this tells me that we need to recognize where God is. God is the ruler of my life in every aspect of my life. He was the one that will pull me out of the hole. And that's where I need to focus on because otherwise things devastate me and I never get past just simply showing up for church. Now I know I'm not an emotional person and everybody else, some people stand up here and they wave their arms and they get excited. That's just not me. My personality struggles with showing a lot of emotions, as you guys can probably guess by the colors that I like to wear. But, uh, you know, I just, I pray a lot. That's, that's my excitement. But here's the thing. Everybody's going to do it different. But the question really is, spiritually, are you staying in a hole or are you rising up before God? Because I personally think that Christians here in the United States are missing the boat because we're not excited about what God's doing. Every one of you had a meal today. Every one of you probably, just about all of you, probably had a cup of coffee. Amen? I am pretty sure most of you didn't crawl out of a cardboard box this morning to, before you had to walk five miles to get here. We are a blessed people. But we can get so focused on bills, we can get so focused on on diagnoses and all this stuff. You know, it's always kind of confused me about Christians is we don't want to die, but we want to go to heaven. And that always confused me because I, I have people that talk about how beautiful and how wonderful it is. And oh, we just, I want to go to heaven so bad. Just don't speed the process. And I'm not trying to get you to go soon. We kind of like having you around. But the fact of it is, is that we need to have a different focus in our life. And heaven's my focus, amen? I miss not having this relationship with God to the extent that I want. 
I mean, I, I get excited when I read things in the Bible where it talks about there's no need for light in heaven because Jesus Christ is the light of all things. That means that Jesus Christ permeates us. Think about that. To me, that's exciting. I love the line in, in Revelations where it says that he will bring us up on, and this is what it's basically saying, he brings us up on his lap and he wipes away every tear. That's a connection with God that I want. Amen? So why would I allow devastation in this world to steal me or rob that from me? Third question, how do you rise up? It says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I love that line. How many people here know Jesus? Then nothing but nothing but nothing but nothing should ever discourage you. Notice the word revelation. That means the full knowledge, the full understanding, the full acceptance of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus tell us? That I am saved, I am redeemed, I have been regenerated, I am a new creature in Christ, and nothing, but nothing can take me from the presence of God, save one thing, me. Satan can't do it unless I allow him to. Amen? But if I'm not careful, I allow that to happen. Here's what I like. You take this verse, we're going to jump back to Job. Because I love a response for Job. Now, Job has gone through all of this stuff. Job has questioned, and, and his friends have spoken, all this stuff. And here's where it comes down to, and I believe we can get to this place. In Job chapter 38, verse, starting in verse 3, he says, Now prepare yourself like a man. And the reason I like that is because, putting it in modern text, God is looking at Job and saying, Okay, dude, suck it up. Time for the big boy pants. Time to grow up. Amen? Amen? And i got to be honest with you, I think sometimes some of us as Christians need to hear that from God. It's time to shake loose, grow up, and quit getting on the milk all the time, and time to eat steak. Because we live in a society today where there's a Christianity is not the problem. Everybody I know is a Christian. Most everybody I know is a Christian. The problem isn't that. The problem is real Christians. And the reason we have such a watered-down form of Christianity is because the real Christians have been quiet too long. And i got to tell you, at your job place, the time that you're going to have the greatest testimony is when you're at your worst. When everything in your life has gone bad and you're still there smiling, that's what they're going to notice. Amen? Put on your big boy pants. And then he says this, And I will question you and you shall answer me. I love, I love this passage. And I'm only reading a small excerpt of this. Because i got to tell you, he grills Job. And if you don't grow up and you don't respond to God as you should and you stay in your hole, trust me, God's going to grill you. Amen? Because God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to rise up. So here's what he says. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Or who stretched a line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with the doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? When I fixed my limits for it and set bars and doors? And when I said, this far you may come and no further, and here are your proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on a form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of its depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the doors of the shadows of death? Have you comprehended the breaths of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. And that's just part of the questions he throws at him. So basically he's saying, listen to me. You may not understand what you're going through, and you will never understand what you're going through. But trying to question me, you're not going to understand. 
The Bible says that God's ways are what? To be understood and he should give us a manual and let us know exactly what's going to happen. Because it's unfair when God just suddenly springs this on me and I'm totally unprepared. And that's just not right, God. <laughs> have you ever had that prayer? Oh, let's be honest. Most of us have had that prayer at one time or another. God, if you would have told me my tire was about to go, I would have made sure the other one was aired up. Amen? You guys know where I'm at. I just got done with the flu and pneumonia, and I'm like, God, if I had known when I was going to get sick, I would have stocked up. Amen? And so he's saying, listen, there's things that are going on in your life you will never, ever, ever understand. It's the Job experience. Job had, Job had no idea what was happening in his life, but God did. And that's what's important. No matter what you're going through right now, God knows where you're at. You have never been lost. You've never been forgotten. You've never been left stranded. God is still involved, whether you feel him or not. Do you think Paul and Silas were feeling chipper when they went to the prison in stocks? Oh, they felt like singing. After they had that nice massage with the whip and all of that, it was just a you know, wonderful experience. But they sang. And what has always fascinated me about that passage more than anything else is not that they sang, but that everybody heard them and those that heard them were moved. Here's what's interesting with the story of Job. At the very end, Job, uh, God criticizes the three friends that criticized Job. And Job had to do a sacrifice. These guys had to bring a sacrifice to Job, not a priest, but to Job so that Job could do the sacrifice for them and pray for them so that God could forgive them. Understand this, when you're devastated, when things, everything's against you, God is still involved and God is going to rectify it for you. Amen. And those that oppose you, God will make them accountable for it. Those that have lied against you, God will make them accountable for it. Satan is held accountable for the damage that he does to God's children. But if we're not careful, I'm so busy sitting in the hole, I never know the victory of Jesus Christ. And we live in a world that needs to know the victory of Jesus Christ. Would you agree with that? In Ephesians 4, 1, it says this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. Now, what did he say? The prisoner of the Lord. Why did he use that terminology? He was sold out. Is what he was saying. I've become encapsulated by God. That's what he was saying. I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. This is another verse that literally says, put on your big boy pants and grow up and be the Christ-like creature I called you to be. Would you agree with that statement? Amen. Amen. And so that's what he's saying is it's time for the church to rise up and become church. Amen. I, you guys all know we can sit here on Facebook and find every kind of church that will tell you everything you want to know and make you feel funny and, and make you feel, give you the warm cuddlies and all that and never talk about Christ. Yeah, one of my southern terms, warm cuddlies. So <laughs> it's, it's my term. <laughs> You know, but you got to understand, where will that get you in the end? I want to talk about Jesus Christ, the reality, the revelation of Christ in us. Last verse, and I'll close with this. And everybody said, praise the Lord. <laughs> 1 John chapter 5, verses 19 through 20 says this, And we know that we are of what? Say it with me. We are of God. No matter what goes on in your life, remember that. God created you from nothing. He had a plan for your life. He chose you. That's hard for us to understand. We say, well, the world's full of people. He could have chose anybody. No, he chose you. You have something specific that God has planted in you to affect others around you. It was not a random mistake. God chose you. God designed you. God picked everything in your life for you. 
Yes, we've had hard times. Yes, we've had rough issues. And that's not God's fault. That's things that came along. But God still made good out of it. Look where you're at right now. If God didn't care, would you be here this morning? But God chose you specifically. So he goes on down and says, And the whole world lies under the sway of what? Satan, the wicked one. Do you think you're going to get some flack? Do you think somebody's going to probably come along and not like you? If you don't believe in that, you might want to go back and reread the Gospels because it does talk a lot about suffering. Amen? He goes on down and says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us what? An understanding. How many of you have read the Bible? I was hoping everybody's hand would go up with that, but uh, I saw a couple. Those of you that didn't raise your hand, please read the Bible. (laughs) Amen? It's got a lot of good stuff in there, all right? But the fact of it is we've read the Bible, we've read scriptures, but do we believe them? Because it says he gives us an understanding. The Bible is full of promises and, and all of this stuff for us. It's amazing to me how many people have read the Bible and yet question it. Well, the Bible says that Jesus would heal us. Yeah, but that's for everybody but me. You ever feel that way? (laughs) I've often wanted to be in God's corner when the lottery hits like $500,000 to hear how many people that are praying. But you know what I really want to hear is after the drawing and somebody else wins, how many people are blaming God? Amen? Amen? I always thought that was kind of a crazy thing. God has something specific for your life. He says that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. What else do you need? Amen? So this morning, if you're going through stuff that's just tearing you apart, Life is hard. Life has just become devastating to you. I want you to know what this message of Job is. It's easy to say, well, yeah, in the end, Job got twice as much. Let me tell you, he didn't get 14 kids overnight. Amen? His flock did not suddenly go boom and reappear. There was a process. There was a work, but God blessed him. God's... He still had to heal from the boils that he had on his body. He still had to mend relationships with his wife. He still had to take and mend relationships with his friends. There was a process, but God was still involved in the blessings. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. You are not devastated. You are not destroyed. God is still God. Amen? Would you stand with me this morning? If you're here today and you feel like today's the end of all things, you wouldn't be the first person. Amen? If life has just seemed to suck every ounce of joy out of you, here's the place to find it. If you just feel like you can't go on anymore, guess what? God's still God. And so as we begin to close in prayer, if you want prayer this morning, I invite you to come to the front. I'm not a miracle worker. None of us are miracle workers. There's only one miracle worker that I know. And that's God. Amen? But I got to tell you, there's something about companionship. When somebody will reach out and pray with you to know that you're not alone in the situation, especially since many of us have walked through times of devastation in our life. So as we close in prayer, if you want... We're here. Because I don't want you leaving here devastated. I want you leaving here victorious. Amen? Because there's people out there that need to know that we're still victorious. God, as we come before you this evening, this morning, God, we just... God, I know that you had a purpose in Job, and God, you revealed to us all that he's gone through. And God, you know each of our lives, and we've prayed before service ever began, that God, that this would go to the very depths of our hearts. 
Because I know that some of us are struggling. Some of us have gone through hardships and it's hard to let go. And God, I'm asking right now in Jesus' name that God, that you just touch our lives in such a mighty way. Allow the Holy Spirit to get, begin to just breathe in us, to heal us, to restore us. God, to help with the pain and the struggles that we're going through. Each of us have a story, God, but you know the heart of each matter. So God, we're asking this morning that God, that you would just move in such a mighty way. And God, as we go from this place that God, we do not go as a defeated people, but God, we go as a victorious army. As I talked about, as the prophet spoke over the valley of dry bones, God. God, the bone became the bone and flesh upon the bones and skin upon the flesh. And in the end, they stood as an exceeding great army. God, I pray that the Spirit would move upon us to make us as such people. Truly, God, guide us and direct us as you have us to go and help us to lay down the burdens that we carry that we might know the true freedom of Jesus Christ in our life. And let us walk in the trueness of the revelation that has been bestowed upon us to know the word like nobody else. God, we ask for all these things right now in Jesus' name. And we give you praise and we give you glory. Amen and amen. May God richly bless you and stir your hearts wherever you go. Praise the Lord.